Board, Monday, March 1st, 2021 at 7 p.m. Uh, meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely, but, but with adequate alternative means of access and where required public participation has been, will be provided in accordance with the governor's March 12th, tw March 12th, 2020 order suspending per certain provisions of the open meeting law. And um, I think uh, meetings are typically broadcast by Frontier Community Access Television. I imagine that's the case tonight with remote connection at DeerfieldMA.us. So there we go. Um, roll call. Let's see, alphabetical. Paul is not here today. Max Antis? Max Antis present. Hey, Rachel? Rachel Blaine, there she is. Yeah, sure, I see her. Uh, and Mary, not yet. I'm, I'm present. Here. There I am. Rachel Blaine, present. Oh, good. Hi. <laughs> uh, Denise Mason. Denise Mason, present. Kathy Wetrova, present. And welcome, Kathy. Really glad to have you. Oh, and there's Anne Mary and Mary Cloutier in time to say, yes, you're here. Yes, she present. Is. Hi. OK. And Annalise. So we do have a quorum, and our majority today would, out of the six of us here, would be four. So we got that settled. Okay. Um, five. Five. Well, let's see. One, two, three. Five four, out of six. Six. No, because Max, Rachel, and Mary, Denise, Kathy, and Emily. One, two, three, count three, you. four, five. Max. Annalie, Denise, Kathy, Rachel, and Anne Mary, and Max. That makes five. And Kathy, that's it. I, Max, Rachel, Anne Mary, Denise, Kathy, and Annalie. Six. We're seven normally. It's six. No, six. Paul's yeah. absent. Carry the one. <laughs> Great. Are you ready for this discussion tonight? <laughs> it's going to be. Oh, well. <laughs> it's okay, Denise. You're keeping us up on our toes. Um, let's see. I guess we review the mail before we review the minutes. That's interesting. Um, we had three notices of public hearings, um, or four notices of public hearings, three in Greenfield and one in Montague. The three in Greenfield have to do with a proposed curb cut, curb cut on Woodland Road, conversion of a two-family home to a three-family home on Conway Street and to extend the general commercial zoning district along Bernardston Road. And that public hearing is on March 11th. In Montague, there's also going to be a public hearing on March 10th regarding a special permit for telecommunications facility in the rural business district. Maybe that means they'll get better internet. Um, I don't know that all of you are receiving this mail. Are you? And do you, if you're not, do you care to? Um, I think that it, I don't receive the mail. I don't think anybody else here does. Um, and I think typically even when we met in person, we would, oh, go ahead, Rachel. No, that's right. Nan, uh, Aunt, Mary, Aunt Mary's right. We don't usually get the, the okay. mail. We review it at the meeting. Okay. All right. Well, the other piece of mail, which actually is interesting and, uh, and perhaps will require a little bit of uh, um, comment, is a request for comment from Saxton, Saxton Signs. I think I did send that request to, out to all of you, although it really doesn't say too much. This is for the nine Greenfield Road uh, Red Roof property, making changes to the existing sign that is currently 500 square feet, reducing it to 323, which sounds like, oh, OK, that's good. However, um, it is a previously pre-existing non-conforming sign and in fact, <clears throat> the new sign also is not in compliance with our sign bylaws. I've asked uh, Jen, potentially Bob Walden, to sort of review that since we didn't really have the specs and the question really is what sort of comment might we want to pass on to the ZBA in relation to this. So Jen, do you have any specifics? I think in particular, it has to do with the height of the sign, but. I think the height stays the same. It's the, Bob, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, the, the 
pedestal that the sign on doesn't change. It's just the actual top of the sign is being reduced in size, which they're doing because they keep having problems with the sign being destroyed in weather. So, I mean, it just simply requires a change, a special permit to change it, even though it seems pretty simple to make it smaller. Well, what, um, how, how is it out of compliance with our sign bylaws? Oh, it, oh, it's very out of compliance. It's super high up in the air. I mean, but it's the height. I believe it's been there since 1979, if I'm correct. I mean, it, there wasn't even a bylaw. It, it's really, it's in non-compliance with our bylaws now. It's a pre-existing non-conforming sign. So, so they're making... I mean, the real determination comes from the zoning board, um, whether it's, you know, more detrimental than to than the sign that was already there, which, my, I mean, my opinion is which not isn't there point. anymore, and it's covered in tarps, and it looks like it, it's awful. You know, I don't well, know that if any tarp, has... that tarp is the sign. It's just a canvas sign that tore. Okay. They, they could put it back exactly the same, but they want to reduce the size. That's why I send it to the zoning board. Right, Jen. Yeah, so I mean, it, they're making it less detrimental. So you know, it's it's, and they can, like Bob just said, it's if it's if they do exactly what's there, they get to keep what's there. Mm -hmm. So it just happens to be that our bylaw says that they have to go to the zoning board of appeals if they want to change that size. So they're making it smaller, which is better. Um, it's just, you know. Yeah. Just so section. 3421 or 3241. Sorry, I got that number all wrong. 34, 3241 in the bylaw says for changes in existing signs and non conforming signs, provided such changes are within the limits established pursuant to section 3220, which is our size requirements, and that is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. So, um, I don't know how you guys want to comment on it, but. Do you have any, uh, any, anybody have any thoughts about this? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, if, if they do it the same size, and it's, then it's, I thought it was essentially grandfathered in, but if they are changing it, substan I mean, changing it in any way, I thought that they would have had to then comply with our current bylaws. No. Okay. The, well, right. the zoning board can decide whether... It's substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood, the change. That, that well, you know, that's their decision. Right, okay. All right. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, I would think that the suggestions would be that the sign is, you know, up kept and that there's no health or safety to anybody that's around, you know, like that could be a comment that the planning board would give, mm -hmm. you know, in reference, you know, that it's up, that the upkeep is maintained. Yeah, because I mean, it's just, I mean, the, the zoning um, the zoning board of appeals is gonna make the ultimate decision of whether or not it's less or more detrimental to the neighborhood and whether or not they want it to comply with our current bylaw. But if you were to make a comment, it would be that it's, you know, kept up and it's health, you know, it's not gonna fall on anybody or, <laughs> you know, it, I mean, there's not too much leeway because it really is up to the Zoning Board of Appeals to make that ultimate decision. That um, <laughs> comment. makes sense for everybody. I don't know that we need, I don't think we really need to vote on this, but that um, we make a request that, that the uh, upkeep, that the sign is maintained. Okay, cool. All righty. Um, uh, and Mary, minutes, can you take us through which ones need to be? Annalee, I'm sorry, before we do that, did we welcome Kathy? Kathy, welcome, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. I don't think we officially welcomed her, so. Right, right. Nice to have you, Kathy. Okay. Does, oh. she, know, does she know everybody? Yeah, let's go around and introduce. Kathy, hi, Emily. <laughs> Acting chair. Right. Uh, Rachel, I'll pass it to you. Rachel Blaine. Rachel Blaine. Yeah, Denise Mason, I think we were chatting before the meeting started. Denise is our vice chair. Um, and Mary Cloutier, I'm the clerk. 
Welcome yeah. aboard. I just realized I was muted. My apologies. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Max there, too. He still is muted. Um, Max? No, I'm here. Hi, Max. Hi. <laughs> hey, Max. <laughs> I um, said the assistant town administrator, and then we also have Bob Walden, our building inspector, building inspector officer, building commissioner. Hi. And then, and I'm, I'm Chris Curtis. Um, I work as the consultant to the planning board. Hi, Chris. Hi. All right. Good. It's nice to be nice. <laughs> it works. Uh, and Mary, minutes. All right. So it seems like <clears throat> we have minutes from December 28th minutes from January 11th and minutes from February 1st. So the 1228 minutes would probably be the first ones to look at. Um, do you guys all have them in front of you? And, and Mary, I reviewed all of them and out of, I forget which one now, but one out of the three had already been approved. I That's know what I thought too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And okay. I just wanted to mention that you did a great job. They were very succinct to the point. So thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thanks. Um, so the mm -hmm. oldest one we have is 1228. I think that one was the one that was voted to, a, we've already voted on that one. I thought it was the January 11th, I think. Yeah. No? Okay. Okay, so do you guys have the January 11th open in front of you too? Um, do we need to um, approve each one individually or? I don't know, Annalee. I, I think that um, if any, it, hopefully you guys have all had a chance to um, look at them. If there's anything we should change it now, um, which is why I was just sort of saying one at a time. Um, and then, we can vote to um, accept them all or both of them because we had already accepted one of them. Yeah, so we're, what are we discussing now, January 11th? Yeah, we had been. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, maybe we just have a, a motion to approve. Yep, do we have a motion to approve the minutes from January 11th? Okay. <clears throat> Denise Mason, I, may, I make a motion to approve the minutes from January 11th. As stated. Second. I'll second. Rachel Blaine, second. Um, and any discussion? Okay. Um, let's see. Alphabetical Max. Go ahead. Rachel. Yes. I uh, vote yay. Rachel yes. Blaine. And Mary? And Mary Cloutier, yes. Denise? Denise Mason, yes. Kathy? Kathy, abstain. Kathy needs to abstain because she abstain. Right. Okay. And uh, Annalie will vote yes. Okay. And then uh, February, February 1st? Um, a motion to approve? I move that we approve the January or February, what is it? February 2nd, February, whatever. Uh-huh, February First, Sorry, yep, minute meetings. And a second? I second that. Thanks. Uh, discussion, any discussion on those? I accidentally closed my doc. Who moved and who seconded? I moved, Denise seconded. Denise Mason seconded. There we go. And uh, no discussion, is that correct? No discussion? Okay, um, we'll do alphabetical uh, first names. Anne Mary. Anne Mary Cloutier, yes. <clears throat> Denise. Denise Mason, yes. Kathy. No, she's abstaining. Abstaining. Max. Max Santis, yes. Rachel. Rachel Blaine, yes. And Annalie, yes. Okay, no, we've got that taken care of. All right. No people like, no people like electric. 
Okay, so um, old business, very old, right? Because um, we're reviewing four potential bylaws. Um, um, as I understand it, our um, process tonight in each bat bylaw category, um, there will be a screen share of the of the potential bylaws with the presenter giving an introduction. Um, then we can have some discussion. Um, and if there are some edits that it seems that there's consensus about, we can type them into the um, into the screen share. And uh, at the end of that, vote on. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Somebody needs to be muted, and I'm not sure who it is because I can't tell. So I'm going to mute everybody that's not talking. Thank you, Jen. Um, we'll vote on bringing the proposed bylaws to a public hearing, um, at which point then there will be a public hearing. Potentially after that, there may be some additional uh, edits, and then we would vote to have it go to town meeting. So. Um, Bottom line, kind of what we decide tonight isn't necessarily the last word on the bylaws. Chris, I got the process correct there. Unloot, unloot, unloot. Yeah, yeah, that looks that sounds great. Okay, let's pass it over to Chris. Chris. Okay, so I've been working on uh, three bylaws with with you all. I think I'd like to take the solar bylaw first, um, and then the site plan review, and lastly, the accessory apartment bylaw, if that's okay with you. And uh, I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. Let's see if that will work. Can you see this? No. Okay. Well, <laughs> there goes that. Jen, are you uh, allowing the screen share? There we go. Cool. Okay. Yeah, we can see it now. Okay, I guess it just took a while. All right, so um, the solar bylaw, we, we have discussed a little bit already and we've made some changes to it. Um, we got a lot of comments um, from the energy committee in between the last meeting and this one and I have reflected those as well in this version of the bylaw. So um, what you see in the dark black um, italic uh, font is the changes from um, our original discussion. And in the red italic font is, are the changes that came from the comments from the Energy Committee, which were, I think, very helpful and helped to um, clarify some issues. So I'll just uh, kind of take you through um, these changes. We talked um, a little bit about passive solar energy systems um, in the, and the, that's a, a definition, a term that's defined in the definition section. And the Energy Committee suggested we also define active solar energy systems. So I've, I've added that definition under 3820 here. And then there was a comment from the Energy Committee that in addition to um, regulating the, the solar arrays and the conversion electronics that we should also make sure that we are regulating the energy storage components for these systems. So in the definitions for large scale and medium scale systems, we've added, um, actually for all three sizes, we've added the term or energy storage components to the definition so that might include things like large batteries or other storage components. I uh, just want to make sure you are you all seeing this as I scroll down. Yes, yes. Okay, good. Um, we talked a little bit the last time about um, the issue of impacts to forest land and farmland. 
the Energy Committee suggested that we use the term forest land and farmland in active production. And, and we want to try to minimize the impacts of these solar systems on, on that specific type of, of forest land and farmland. Please feel free to interrupt me if you have comments on any of these um, changes. I'm not seeing the red on this. Am I just not seeing the red? Is that the most recent version up there? Uh, in 3837, uh, site location it's, of solar wait, energy. Hold on a second. I'm not sure I'm, we're, we're not, I don't see what you're seeing. And when I was scrolling through, I didn't have the right one. I've got to look, this one was from back too long ago. Yeah, I, I don't find the right one. I'm not seeing it. Okay. Uh, I don't think you have the red line version. Oh, 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 okay. Wait, wait, wait. You know what? It's so he has it. No. Oh, the red one. Here, 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 here. Okay, I can do it now. I can do it now. Yeah. Does everybody have it though? Do, they, do we? This is what we've seen before. And now I'm feeling like, yes, 225 is the edits, right? Correct. Um, That's right. Let, let me um, go back and share the right document. And then I can be your person there. All right, I okay, was so sharing now. the wrong one. Okay, so, and now I'm gonna so mute myself because I got some kind of. So just to be clear, I guess I, I'm not then sharing my document is that correct that's correct that's correct i'm the one sharing rachel oh okay rachel thank you um so if you scroll down um what we're what we're seeing oh, there we are or energy storage components that's what we we're looking at yeah. before i've seen that but i couldn't figure yeah. what and then uh we're getting down here to the it's the 30, where, where was the, where you had just left off with a forest land. 38, 37. Yeah, keep, keep, 37. Keep going down yep. Until you hit, well. You already passed it. There. Right there. So you see the red font there. Um, so we talked about having, um, we wanted to minimize the impacts of solar energy systems on um, farmland and forest land and, and the Energy Committee suggested using the term inactive production to, to help sort of define which types of forest land and farmland we were really concerned about. I just, I would suggest just going down to the next red font area. Um, so this one, they wanted, the Energy Committee's comment was that um, they wanted to make sure that the issue of insurance covered not just the um, loss or failure of the system, but also any um, losses that happened during construction. So we added that, that term construction here. Let me also clarify, I spoke with two people on the Energy Committee. It wasn't necessarily the whole committee that made these recommendations. Right, good point. Okay, if you keep scrolling. Um, is this a, a it's permitted the energy, this is a H, no, utility notification. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how to, okay, that's better. I, I couldn't quite read it. Um, so that, the change here was that we, they wanted us to, um, well. Sorry, flute. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was trying to make it bigger. There we go. Almost. All right, I'm not, I'm not seeing it yet. Okay. 
I was doing so well. There, there we go. go. Okay. Um, so this was, um, in terms of notifying the utility, what they wanted us to notify the utility um, was that uh, that the the um, that there has been notification that the, the utility company has permitted the energy system, not just, um, I can't remember what the original language was there to be honest, but that, that was the, the key point was that the permit had been given by the utility company. Um, There's more. Yeah, that's the same issue um, that I discussed before. It just appears in two different sections of the bylaw. Yeah. This is Denise. I had a question. Did we just pass, I think, the abandonment part? We're yeah. just coming up to that now, and that's where the, the most significant um, change is. It's a little further down. Oh, Rachel, just, I, just, just, I just wanted there, to there point, we go. I'm sorry. Before you go down, I just wanted to point out, if you go back up to the top, to the abandonment, the beginning, that's the only place you've got at the end of the sentence, you've got site plan review authority, but every but every other place you put planning boards. So I wasn't sure whether you needed to change that. That, that is a good catch, Denise. That should that okay. should be planning board there. Um, so we'll uh the gold we'll stores for that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this, I'm just trying to make a note here, so I, I don't lose that. Um, change. Chris, I did have one other question on that, the abandonment okay. part. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, whether I misunderstood, whether I just didn't understand the whole thing. Um, I looked at enforcement and I thought, well, how will we know? I mean, do they have to then get in touch with us every year? We're just going to find out if they've abandoned it for a year. How would we know that? Um, I think we um, we talked about that in just yeah. trying to find the section here. Okay, I may have missed that. Says the owner shall notify the planning board um, under 38952. The owner shall notify the planning board if applicable by certified mail of the proposed date for discontinued operations or plans for removal. Um, there's also a section um, that talks about what happens if they don't notify you. I'm just trying to find it here. Okay. Yeah, I was just concerned about enforcement. It's like, how do we enforce that? And is there any yeah. penalty? So under 38953, um, the decommissioning section, if we can just scroll down a little bit to that. The language there um, says that if the... Uh, if the owner fails to remove the installation in accordance with these regulations within 150 days of discontinued operations or abandonment, the town may enter the property and physically remove the installation at the owner's expense, drawing from the escrow account or upon the bond or other financial surety provided by the applicant. So that I think is the section that addresses okay. your 
concern. And then just below that, we've added some further details about the issue of financial surety, which are in the red font here. I'm trying to figure out how to get my screen to uh, show the entire document. But, you know, rather than reading through that entire thing, maybe folks can kind of read it, read through it um, and see whether or not you feel comfortable with the, the terminology and the language here. There's a process for estimating the costs. Um, of uh, removal and um, uh, sp a specification of how much of a deposit needs to be put down and that, that it's held by the town treasurer. So this is again, we're trying to address some comments from the uh, energy committee that there needed to be more elaboration of, of this section. Does that make sense? Rachel, are you, um, are you commenting? No. Oh, I thought I, I thought I saw your lips moving and I wasn't sure if you knew you were muted. I am. Well, here we go. Sorry. We, when we did Lakeside, was it called Lakeside? Anyway, the, the firm from Chicago that developed the, the um, um, quarry, that large scale quarry um, development that we had, this is very familiar. So that, and that's, I think worked out, I don't know if Bob's still on, but that's worked out pretty well. We had an escrow account. <laughs> So this is good. I mean, what I'm saying is this kind of mirrors what we did with that very, that large. Um, yeah, I'd say that a quarry is a very kind of similar situation that you want to be able to recover the landscape after the use has completed its, you know, useful life. So, so that's good. If it, if it mirrors it, that that's what we that's want. What, yeah, exactly. It feels, it feels uh, like what we, what we were able to do there. Okay. So this was kind of the more most significant change, um, and I think it's also the the last significant one. There's um, there's a second set of definitions in the bylaw, and the energy committee asked a question about why they, there's two sets of the same definitions, and and the reason for that is that um, we have definitions that stay within the bylaw in that section that, that um, and then the, the way the town has has chosen to um, to set up its zoning, there's also a separate definition section that generally keep all of the definitions in, in one spot. And I think that's actually not a bad idea because you know if someone's searching for definitions, it can be difficult to find them, might not be a, a really a bad thing to have it in two different places. Um, I have a so question. I have a question, actually, yeah. if you don't mind me interrupting. But could, could you guys discuss that solar access with me since I'm on here? That if you scroll back up. Which number? Just scroll back up a little bit. There we go. Here. This 3842. Yeah, she, well, my screen doesn't act seem to be as fast as yours, but... <laughs> Sorry. When we get into these setbacks and the solar access just above, I'm still seeing other admit, other admin, amendments. Yeah, th this so, whole section. This is the one so I'm going to have the most. I'm going to have the most trouble with this. Is, is that Bob speaking? Yes. Okay, great. So I I know that you mentioned that you were concerned about enforcement. Uh, so we replaced the solar setback section that originally had a fairly convoluted way of, of trying to make sure that there wasn't going to be shadows cast from a property that eliminated the uh, solar access from a neighboring property. And you wanted 
I think something that was enforceable and didn't require a lot of complex calculations. Um, so what I tried to do was, was find an example where there, we could actually put a table in and the table, uh, if you kind of scroll down just a small bit, you can see this. Um, the minimum required solar access setback under this bylaw is now directly related to the height of the, the building. Um, so if you have a 20 foot tall building and it's in a residential and it's a residential use, the, re the required solar setback is, um, is 31 feet. If it's a, if it's a commercial use in the commercial, um, area, it's nine feet. So um, just to be, just to be clear here, you can't build a two story house. 10 feet from your property line, which is currently our setback, because it may right. on so the this could... on the um, northernmost edge of that property. So it would only really affect the the northern property line, which you can kind of see in uh, uh, on the letter C just above the table. It says the table illustrates the minimum required solar setback from the northern property line for structures based on their height to meet the shadow requirements. So we're trying to trying to prevent the situation where you've got two houses that, you know, both want to have solar panels and, and one is casting a shadow on the neighboring property's solar panels so they don't function any longer. Um, we want to, you know, try to prevent that from happening. Um, and it's it's really for new development that this comes into play. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking if you got a, say, a hundred foot wide lot, how do you place a house on it with a 50 foot setback? Um, so you're thinking about, yeah, the, the 28 foot tall building with a 49 foot setback. I mean, it's not hard to hit 30 foot with like a two foot, with a two story colonial. I mean, a, you know, right. a normal house. All right. Um, so I guess we'd, we'd almost have to play out some examples of this. Um, but again, because we're not talking about all four property lines, the, the idea behind this would be that you would shift the location of the home to the section of the property where you, you would not be casting that same kind of a shadow um, yeah, I'm just going with the worst case scenario where the whole entire lot becomes unbuildable because you can't fit the house on it. Right. What do we do um, in that so situation? If, if you shift, um, Rachel, if you could scroll down to D below the table. That's where we address that issue, Bob. And it says here that the provisions of this section shall not cause any building, any buildable building lot to be rendered unbuildable. However, okay. the provisions in the section shall mean that the site of a structure on a lot and the design and the height of the structure shall be modified to the extent feasible to prevent the loss of solar access on an adjacent property. Okay, I get that, but so you're, I don't know, it's just really difficult. So you, like, if we modify it to an extent feasible, I mean, that might mean what, they can't build a two-story house, they can only build a one-story house? Well, I, I see your point, and maybe we need to be more specific in that particular section of the bylaw. I, just, I mean, I'm not trying to impose my will on, I'm just having a hard time with how I'm going to uh, tell somebody that they can't build a two-story house on their legal building lot and I, what in our 10 foot setback requirements say the property line is to the north is a 10 foot according to our bylaws and now we have a new setback like how who's going to win that argument um or right. how would, you know um, max I Ma his hand raised chris where, where's where's the setback coming from Who's, who's concerned? Because we're gonna have to change our zoning setbacks for the potential of a solar installation that may or may not happen. 
Well, I think this is really oriented toward is, is um, this, whose concern is this? Who brought this up? Is this something in the state regs or is this just something you feel is important? It, it's something that is in um, the state's um, model zoning Where? regulations. And it is a, it's, it is a complicated um, issue. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, my screen just went blank for some reason. Um, so, so I guess we're trying to address the situation where, um, you know, there's a residential property that wants to have solar panels, and their, and their, and their entire home is being shaded by the adjacent, uh, a new, a new building that comes in that that it really eliminates their their access to the sun for some maybe very expensive solar panels that they just put on their on their roof. That's that's the issue, I guess, that we're we're trying to address here. We want to try to maintain access to the sun for for all properties. And we, I'm trying to do it in a way that's the least onerous and most readily enforceable way possible. That makes sense. It's it's like it's it's a it's a big stick for a small problem, I think. Bob, what well, would you suggest to sort of address I, the concern I, but do it in a in a reasonable way? I think there has to be a a way out. Like this is a great idea, but it just seems really restrictive. Like, how do you not, how do you do that? I mean, how do you tell somebody that they can't build a new barn because it's gonna put a shadow on their neighbor's property when they have every right to build a barn? I just don't, I mean, I don't, like I said, I don't wanna impose my will. This is my town. I'm not a member of Deerfield and my job's enforce it, but really difficult for me to try to wrap my head around how I tell people this. And I, and I, and like, um, you know, this may never come up, but if it does, it'd be a real issue. And I, also, I know you said the northern border, but I mean, I got to thinking about that. That's also the orientation of the house. If the house is running parallel to the border, it's going to cast a shadow different than if it's running at an angle to the border. Um, it's so complicated. I have a question. So can I just talk this back out loud for a moment? So somebody owns a house and they put solar on top. Somebody buys the lot next door and says, well, I wanna put solar on top of my house, but I wanna put it where they have their shadow. So we're, before we have that problem saying, hey, don't build a house where the shadow is. I mean, essentially, isn't that what we're saying? No, what we're saying no. is that the person next door has solar panels on their house and, and then somebody buys the lot next door and they can't build a house because it's gonna cast a shadow on that house or you couldn't build an outbuilding such as a barn or a garage or that might cast a shadow on those solar panels. That's the way I'm gotcha. interpreting it. Okay, now I understand, thank you. Well, you know, I, I, I hear your concern, Bob, and it makes good sense to me. Um, I think maybe we need some language that is, um, oftentimes in zoning you use language like to the extent feasible, um, they shall, you know, minimize the uh, the impacts of shadows on neighboring solar panels and properties. Yeah, and I um, think if it wasn't possible to do that, then they need a way out. I think. I mean, right. So I, mean, I, I think it's hearing that we need to maybe rethink this section a little bit and. Um, and maybe make it less restrictive. Um, how do how do you feel about putting the numbers and, and the table in the in the bylaw, Bob? Because I was trying to really do that to help. No, I appreciate you did that because it really showed what I was imagining was, you know, a, a thirty foot house. I mean, I was a builder for years. An average colonial is going to hit thirty feet, no problem, and that's a 
54 foot setback from the property line, which is huge. We only require a 10 foot setback on the side and rear in a oh, residential wow. area. I mean, it, you okay. know, once again, it depends how the lot's oriented, but that that's major. And it is going to diminish the motivation to put a in more um, thickly settled areas to put solar panels if you don't have a little protection against shadow, I guess. It's just a yeah, difficult, think, like, how, how do you regulate access to the sun? I mean, I get what right. you're trying to do. But. but it's just like a view. It's the same as a view. So you, you know, if you want the view, you have to buy the property. It, Correct. It sounds like what we're <clears throat> moving towards is something that is somewhat less uh, defined, although sometimes it's nice to have the definitions, but less exact and to the extent feasible. Um, I don't know if that's something that, um, Chris, you could uh, sort of draft some language and have Bob take a look at it and see if that seems to make reasonable sense and then we bring it back. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. This is Jen. Um, I was just wondering, like, if if that could be a case by case where they would look at the property and, like you said, and then it would be up to the planning board to dis or whoever to decide that it's not causing a problem. It's just a it, case by case. It's going to be up to Bob to to determine this, and that's going to be very difficult to monitor right bob yeah oh yeah very difficult i mean that that's a great way of looking at it like maybe there's a an appeal of some sort that gets it to a board to have this discussion where yeah and maybe not quite so restrictive i mean I like the part where in the up higher it said, you know, couldn't cast a shadow more than 16 feet on the other property line. Like something like that is a little different than setting the house back 54 feet. It, yeah, that's. So I don't know. I don't have a good answer. I'm just concerned about it. Well, you know, I'm sorry. And <laughs> it sounds like there are considerations here, and perhaps we won't be able to wordsmith it right now. Does it make sense to? Um, I mean, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to have exa exactly said public hearing on all four of these and maybe, um, or we might have to meet again in a couple of weeks just to look at a couple of things. I don't know, but. So what would be the problem that Bob's pointing to the, the this 16 feet, what would be the problem with extending that to residential? Because that just seems less restrictive. That's like saying, okay, your shadow is not gonna you know, encringe too far onto the neighbor's property. Now we're not completely making the new lot unbuildable. We're, we're kind of trying to be reasonable, more a little more reasonable about it. And I, even that, I'm not sure how I judge that, but it seems less restrictive. But so, and so this part, the residential properties, a new residential structure shall not cast a shadow extending more than six feet beyond the property line. Of course, time, well, that, time of day, that, whatever. That's even better, six feet. I'm sorry, I didn't read that one because I, didn't really get a chance to go over this, but that kind of contradicts the setback. Like, I, I just don't know how you judge it. Like, so if the 30 foot house is, I don't, Chris, how did you come up with the, that table, I guess? Or, or would it make sense to just remove the table and section C then? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Maybe that the table should come out. Um, the table, it. just to answer Bob's question, uh, came from, a community in Oregon that actually went through the process of calculating how much of a of a shadow would be cast by each type of of a building, um, and that was probably and, done on the on the solstice, right? Or because that was the original yeah. language, exactly. Yeah. So that's so the whole the, thing too. Is the here, and and then how is like if somebody brings a building permit? and it is the darkest time of the year, are you just saying that, like, how do you even judge that? Like, does it, 
Well, that's why I put the table in. <laughs> because I know, then it's just so, being so like, I don't know. They're going to come up with new technology and we're going to have to change this anyways. So. <laughs> yeah. So, well, how do people feel about removing the table, removing section C and, and keeping it at 16 feet for commercial and six feet for um, residential? Well, I guess that brings us back to the need for the table, though, to Chris's point. Like, then how do you... Well, How do I? <laughs> I mean, I appreciate all your feelings and stuff, but if this is based on uh, <clears throat> what we can only assume is someone's scientific measurements, I guess I feel like um, here we have some work that people have done using math, and then we have some people saying, well, it doesn't feel right, um, and then we're going to abandon it all together. I guess I'm not sure how comfortable I feel with that. Um, you know, there is a whole category of architecture called a spite building that people do create, you know? So I don't know, I, I guess I'm hesitant to throw out the baby with the bath water. Um, people do pay a lot of money for their solar arrays. Um, and I don't, I mean, if it happened to me, I would have the opposite feeling, you know? I, yeah, would, but, I mean, what if you bought the lot next to the person who bought the solar panel, now you can't build on it? I mean, it's the same argument. I well, mean, I don't, I'm going to get out. I'm going to stop because I'm, I'm just having trouble with enforcing. Um, that's all. Well, I don't want to have trouble with enforcing anything, don't we? I mean, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I was. He's what, the code what, enforcement what, officer, so he's the one that has to either issue a building permit or not issue a building permit. So, I mean, what he says and how he's going to enforce it actually has a huge play in this. So, I, I I understand that, but my my I mean. Isn't it like if you've already purchased something like for to have the second person come along and be like, well, I want to be able to build whatever I want, despite the fact that you have solar panels doesn't strike me as the right thing to do either, you know, so well, I don't, I don't think it's build whatever you want. It's building whatever is legal. No, I understand that. I'm not saying whatever you want, but I'm saying that having no consideration for your neighbor's, you know, equipment maybe isn't the thing that we want to encourage either. Okay. All right. I'm not trying to argue with it. I'm just. Yeah. Oh, I'm not either. I'm just trying to understand it. Like, what's the best way to go about this? We have something that has been um, collect data that's been collected. Uh, and I'm just saying that, you know, just to throw that out. I don't know. I think that there's some value to it. There may be some value, but you also have to think like, anti-development, anti-community, anti-neighborhood, you know. So, you know, looking at all of that and seeing how um, the town is going to enforce it and do building permits, invite people, because people are going to be like, well, we have to look at all of these different areas in order, you know, we have to look at the Conservation Commission, we have to now look at the zoning bylaw, we have to look at um, the solar bylaw now. Or well, then I think that, you know, maybe going back to what, um, was being said before about um, coming and talking to us because I think Max is right. Like this may be like, you know, never or once or not that big a deal. And I feel like for, you know, how often we might encounter this, maybe it's just easier. We probably- well, it'll be a review. By now. I mean, I'd have to review this on every single building application for every garage building that comes across my desk. Every single one, if this is in there. Because there would there's be a solar array next door. No, this says solar access. There's, they could potentially put the solar array on later. I mean, then what? Then, you know, then they can't build a garage or a barn or something. I don't know. I mean, I'm just. It just opens up a can of worms when we're, I mean, the number of permits and the type of permits that Bob sees commercial and residential and, you know, agricultural. It's just, it makes it a diff difficult thing to um, manage. So we have a couple hands up. Um, Annalie, do you want to hear from uh, Tim? Um, hi, Tim Hilchey. I'm the chair of the Conservation Commission. Um, not that that has anything to do with solar panels, but uh, sometimes it does. Um, several things. One is when you get a solar installation, solar people come and they use a tool that says um, in a 12 month period, this is the range 
of energy you're going to get. And this is where the sun's going to be. And this is how much insulation is going to fall onto these solar panels. So this is very variable with the seasons. The other thing I want to point out is if you have two colonials of the same size and they have a roof mounted solar panel on one of them, what you're really worried about is when the sun is low, is it going to cast a shadow on your solar panels low in the sky? In the middle of the summer, it's going to have an entirely different profile. So I think there is a possibility that people are overestimating and um, you know, there should be some way to accommodate somebody who's put solar panels on their house when there's an empty lot next door. Now, this happens in cities, it happens <clears> in towns. And if you adopt this bylaw, then it's the law. And then you have to deal with it. It's just like when the electrical code changes. You know, you have to put in these uh, fault resistant circuit breakers in your panel when for many, many years you never had to. And I've heard builders tell me that this is add, adds five or $10,000 to the cost of building a house, but it's yeah. now the law. So you need to enforce it as the building inspector. <laughs> so I do think that there's a way to make this work. And maybe you just need to spend a little more time and maybe bring a solar installer in to talk to people. So you can you had a great that. point about two houses the same height. So say you got two colonials the same height with roof mounts. Now their shadow has now moved up 30 feet in the air. Yeah, but the, the solar panels, exactly. You know, right. The so house, that shadow's completely irrelevant now. Yeah, it'll hit the it'll hit the windows, but it won't hit the solar panels. Right. So it really does, you can still have a buildable lot. It may you might have to change the design of the house you want to build, but that might mean hey, I'm not gonna buy this piece of land, I'm gonna buy another piece of land where I can build this 35 foot colonial that I wanna build. And somebody else comes in and buys and builds a ranch and it doesn't have a problem. So it doesn't make the lot unbuildable, it just means that somebody has to rethink the design of their house or rethink whether they wanna buy that lot instead of another lot. I'd like to hear Nick next, and then maybe if we could take a step back and decide how we're going to continue with this, because I think it's a valuable discussion, but we have three other sets of bylaws and we just need to figure out how we're going forward. Thanks, Tim. Nick? Yeah, I just, um, basically it was the whole discussion of, um, uh, I can't remember what word she used, but like the, um, building something kind of in spite of your neighbor kind of deal. Um, the way this is set up would also kind of have the same effect. If I was an existing homeowner and the lot next door was vacant, where I could just say, you know what, I'm going to put my solar panels as far to my southern border as possible. So then that way, no one can build in that lot next to me because they're gonna be casting their shadow and now they have to set back 50 feet because I decided to be the spiteful neighbor because I wanted to keep a vacant lot next to me and I put my solar panels as far south as possible. So that was just the opposite side of the coin where rather than building a building to block a neighbor's solar panels in spite, me, be, me being spiteful and putting solar panels as far away as I could so that no one could build there. Well, just to be, just to address that comment that the bylaw doesn't, um, it, it doesn't matter where the solar panels are on, on the lot. Uh, so that, that issue would not be relevant um, based on the way well, this, it would, this, it, it uh, would be relevant in the fact that if I built them in a reasonable location, maybe my solar panel placement wouldn't have even affected the lot next door, um, whether they built 10 feet away from the border or not, they wouldn't have casted a shadow on me because I put my solar panels you know, further north on my property because it fit my house better. But you know what? I just don't want the neighbor to build on that property. So I'm gonna put them as close to that border as possible. And you know what, I'll go ground mounted. So then that way they totally would be affected even if they put a fence up. I think this is it, a good example of, their, of how complex the issue is. I'm wondering, yeah. since this seems to be the only section of the solar bylaws that I believe that we're having some concerns about, I'm wondering if Chris and Bob and um, whomever else they might feel might be sort of 
able to add, add some expert opinion to this might be able to address this and then come back at our next meeting with um, really just looking at this one section. Does that seem reasonable, Planning Board? Yeah, this is Denise. That, that makes sense to me, I think, because we're going to go round and round in circles, I think, you know, not coming to any conclusion tonight. I, I agree. I think that this is a, a good point to iron out. Lori Busada has her hand raised. I don't know if that's just, is she on the Energy Commission? Lori? Um, I just wanted to um, clarify Nick's thoughts there. And Chris, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe the the purpose of the bylaw is that the house would not cast a shadow on the lot. It doesn't say it wouldn't cast a shadow on somebody else's solar panels. So if that, you choose to put your solar panels close to your lot line, then you're really um, taking a chance. You can't prevent what somebody else does. Is that correct? That's a good clarification, Lori. That's what, what I was trying to say earlier, but you said it much better. Okay. All right, let's put this aside. If, if Chris and Bob, does it make sense for the two of you to sort of try to parse this out with some help and bring it back to our next discussion? We were not quite under the gun yet, but we're close for getting a yes. meeting and whatnot. Okay, good. All right, moving forward. <laughs> oh, do we need to vote to continue oh. this? It's an open here. It's an open, um, isn't it? No, it's not a public hearing yet. This was just our discussion. We haven't voted to bring it to public hearing. That has to happen, right? Right. Okay, thank you. Um, it's now eight o'clock. We kind of uh, might turn into pumpkins in an hour. So let's see what we can do um, with, uh, Chris, your choice is site plan review next. Yes. Um, Rachel, would you be able to share that mm -hmm. bylaw on your screen? The site plan um, review amendments are um, suggested amendments to the existing site plan review standards that add a section um, that's called green development performance standards to the, the site plan review. And the planning board spent an extensive amount of time going through these about a year ago. And I realized that many of you were not um, around for that discussion. So I think um, this is a bylaw that um, I'm gonna probably need to ask what questions folks have about it based on your reading of it, but I'll try to do a kind of a, a, an over, overview of, of uh, what it does. So the idea uh, of the Green Development Performance Standards is to try to limit um, the, the impacts of development two sites that might um, result in the, um, in the removal of, for example, all the trees on a piece of property or the, um, the, the grading of a property to eliminate all of the, you know, the existing contours in, in the land um, or uh, might have significant impacts on stormwater or uh, similar types of things. So we're trying to um, trying to establish some standards that are kind of common sense standards to um, to limit site disturbance, to um, preserve some of the the most important trees on property. Um, there's also a, a mention of solar access here, but it's it's more in, in in the form of the orientation of buildings to try to promote passive solar access. There's some standards for landscaping and water reduction. Um, do, I have the right, do I have the right one? Just so you know, Chris, can you see it? It's the one uh, updated yeah. one. Yeah, January 21st. OK, thank you. Sorry. That's correct. There are standards for um, protection and buffering of agricultural land. Uh, some standards for parking and trip reduction for pedestrian and bicycle access for storage of hazardous materials, uh, for light pollution reduction, collection of and storage of recyclables and construction waste management. So there's a lot of detail in this bylaw. I'm hoping that folks have had a chance to kind of read through it and um, 
and think about it. The last time we talked about it, there was a pretty detailed discussion and, and the, the things that are shown in red in the bylaw again are the most recent amendments that the planning board had made and discussed. Um, but again, it's been it's been a while since we've we've had a more detailed discussion about this. So Rachel, Rachel, can you stop? On 5415, we were just talking about uh, construction or expansion of large and medium scale ground mounted solar installation. Would that be the case? I mean, would it we be looking at large or medium or are we just looking at large here, Chris? Well, I'm glad you actually raised that because the, the changes to the solar bylaw um, change these terms that are in the site plan review. And uh, so we want to make sure we, we correct that. Um, but we would be talking about the large and the medium scale under site plan review. Okay, great. Um, under definitions, does anyone have any questions with those? Um, I am wondering in 5440 under procedures, if anyone doesn't have anything until then, <clears throat> um, I know that there has been some question in relation to other issues as to whether or not <clears throat> um, proposals should come before planning board first, zoning board first, simultaneous. Is this an area where we could clarify that a little bit <clears throat> under the procedures? section or is that not <clears throat> what well just to be clear the the proposed changes um that we're making are again in the bold font all of the the, the font that you're looking at that's not bold is, is your existing bylaw so we, we're not proposing any changes to the procedure section at this point but you you certainly could do that uh, since we're going through the site plan review bylaw, and if you want to fix other issues at the same time, uh, this would be a good time to do it. Um, it's just not part of what we were working on originally. Well, seems like it's an issue that's come up maybe since a year ago. I don't know how the rest of the committee feels about it, the board feels about it, and also whether or not that would be something that Adam Costa would weigh in on. Is there specific language in the procedure section, Annalie, that you're you're thinking about? I just wasn't sure if the procedure section was the place for it. I just know that there has been question as to whether or not uh, something should come before one board before coming to the other. And it seemed like procedures, I don't know, <laughs> it seemed like if we're talking about site plan review, that someplace in there we would want to address, we could potentially address that. Um, Rachel and Mary. Matt. Uh, no, I, I have some thoughts. I mean, one of the one of the features of this is that we've all been <clears throat> met with another group. I mean, it's always been just more about board cooperation, and or um, or um, administrative suggestion. You know, we didn't. We've never had anything in the bylaw that particularly orders go here first, then here, then here, then here. And you can see it right here. Prior to the commencement, the project gets site plan review approval <laughs> from the planning board. I mean, that, that's what the planning board wants. It's kind of like the, you ask the surgeon, the surgeon says cut. And the physical therapist says exercise. I mean, I think this is where we haven't really addressed this other than episodically when it's kind of worked out to say, oh, we should meet at the same time as the ZBA or the CONCOM. Well, if you scroll down a little further in the procedures section, there's a line that says, uh, no building permit shall be issued by the building inspector and or no special permit or variance shall be issued by the Board of Appeals without the written approval of the site plan by the planning board. Oh, okay, so it addresses it. It's just whether or not we follow that. And I am sorry to interrupt. I can't figure out where the raisy hand thingy is. I don't mean to be an interrupter, sorry. Um, 
So as of late, there was an issue about, you know, you have, um, you know, 60 days to get a site plan review. And as I was reading through this, I didn't see any 60 day vocabulary, um, but that might've been in a draft before I came along. Right so um, Chris, I'm wondering if that's striking any bells with you. Well, if you look at the middle of the screen that's showing right now, it references right. the 60 days. Um, the planning okay. board should review and act upon the site plan with such conditions as deemed appropriate within 60 days of its receipt and notify the applicant of its decision. So Adam Costa was saying that a lot of, um, you know, communities don't have any timing um, issue or language like that. And I was wondering, uh, you know, if I could ask the other board members what they thought of that and if they think that that's you know helped us out or maybe we should reconsider that while we're considering everything else because i would say get rid of it if other communities don't have it um and we can eliminate one more little hurdle for ourselves you know bureaucratically um i think that we should get rid of that that's long and short of what I'm saying. Max has his hand raised. Max? Uh, I, I raised my hand back when we were talking about uh, procedural, you know, which board you went in front of. And the thing was that we ran into the situation where somebody brings a building that doesn't comply with the zoning uh, and needs a ZBA approval, um, but they want us to approve a site plan based on a non-conforming building, which, you know, I have trouble with doing. And then, you know, the size of the, you know, the stormwater impacts and things like that. So I, it'd be good to have someone get their, uh, their variance prior to, you know, getting a site plan, Is, you know, a site plan issued. So actually what you're saying, Max, is that potentially the ZBA should go before the planning board. Yes, because to me, you know, if a, a building doesn't comply, then how can you approve it? You know, and if they're not gonna get an approval, you're just encouraging them to, you know, come up with something that doesn't comply because they know that they can say to the ZBA, well, the planning board approved this. So what, you know, you're, you're kind of kind of like the, the, the going back and forth between two authority figures, you know, well, they said this is okay, you know. And, um, well, Max, I think, I think you raise a, a good point and it's, you're raising kind of a bigger issue here. Um, my, my response to, to that, the overall issue is that the special permit um, and the site plan re review uh, procedure should be combined and should should be handled by the planning board rather than the ZBA. Um, I think that makes it a much cleaner process, um, and it, it eliminates some of that some of that conflict at least. But that's you know that's a bigger that's a much bigger fish than we're frying <laughs> right now, I guess. Um, and it may be a discussion that the board needs to have with the ZBA. But oftentimes it's it's a special permit with site plan review process that communities have established and the planning board issues both of those in a simultaneous kind of way. Hmm. Uh, Tim and Tolly, if you're addressing this particular issue. Tim? Um, yes, um, I just wanted to suggest that um, one thing that's been a problem in looking at what's highlighted on the screen the language looks to say that the planning board needs to make a decision within 60 days or, and you may need more than 60 days to review all the questions that are raised. So um, the second part where it refers to 60 days is a typical planning um, uh, bylaw that requires you to start taking action within 60 days. I think this this thing that's highlighted right now is dangerous <laughs> and you should think about it. Thank you, Tim. Tolly?
Hi, Tolly Stark, Keats Road. Um, I just wanted to bring to your attention um, section 5421 of our zoning bylaw that does state about having a site plan before applying for a specific zoning relief such as variance or special permit. Um, and the reason why that's there is because it's very hard for a board to um, you know, be able to really identify whether zoning relief, considering it's a, a very discretionary thing, um, is appropriate when there's not a site plan or they don't have the information to act on and or know what they're voting to give relief to when they don't have an approved site plan, which is why it's actually part of our zoning bylaw that says you need to have that for certain zoning relief. So I think it makes sense um, that the planning board would have reviewed everything before it would go to the zoning board of appeals. And having that in procedure, I think would um, help the town avoid a lot of missteps that could occur um, in these processes. So thank you. Well, it seems like um, these are some important issues. I understand Chris's comments that, you know, maybe this is bigger than what we initially embarked on a year ago, but in fact, um, we're certainly seeing that it's pro it can be problematic. So I, I do think, I mean, the, it's been made mentioned that the ZBA should weigh in. I wonder about Adam Costa and I also wonder about the select board, I don't know. So I wonder if we can continue looking through, um, but I mean, the, this yet again might be something we need to return to. Sorry about that, but continue with our review of, of the rest of these bylaws here and um, or proposed bylaws and see if there's other things we can agree upon or that need to be fleshed out a little bit more. Does that seem reasonable? And Lee, I'd like to push back just a little bit on this one point about this 60 days. Okay. I think this, this really is important to come back to and not to get lost in the shuffle. I think that this is a fulcrum for a lot of uh, important decisions that might come down the pike. And I think that 60 days is not enough. And if Adam Costa says we don't even need to have a time limit, then I would prefer not to have a time limit. Other, how, yeah, sounds reasonable to me, um, Denise. Yeah, um, I completely agree with Ann Mary on that. I think that's, and, and Tim said the same. I think it's just, it ju it's complicating matters. It's, I think it's just tying our hands. And I also concur with what Tali said too. I mean, I don't understand how something could go to the ZBA before we have not approved a site plan review. So, you know, as long as we're doing this, I just like to do a thorough job and not breeze through it. Because I think they're two really big issues. And I think if we spend a little bit more time on it, we won't have as many issues in the future. Nick, we'll come to you for a minute. Um, I don't know if um, uh, Kathy, Rachel, Max, you have any uh, different opinions on that? Or it sounds like we're talking about. Uh, I have a, not a different, but I do think that, and I, I would cite our recent work with the Whitney um, um, Hill. The, yeah, Whitney Hill um, project that. Um, it is important that the planning board feel a certain heat behind each of these projects. Um, and I, I know that's, you know, that's part of the designation of a 60 days to move on it. Um, just just uh, to, this, to speak to the other side and not to have things happen precipitate, you know, without due process, but to maybe some sort of, uh, I think I heard this earlier that there was some mm, action taken within a certain amount of time so that not only did the planning board feel some heat to move the project um, along, but the applicants themselves felt some, some um, urgency to address issues. I don't disagree um, with the kind of what I see as perhaps tying hands uh, with a 60 day deadline. Um, and we've, we've worked within that before um, without, we have great administrative staff right now, but when we had, uh, you know, a dearth of administrative staff, we were sometimes really scrambling um, to address things that came to us and hadn't been brought forward. So that's, I'm kind of speaking out of both sides of my mouth, but I do think that just attending to somehow the, 
the mm, moving, keeping things moving. That's all. Well, but create language that keeps it moving, but doesn't create a loophole at the same time, right? That's the force our hand in any yeah. kind of direction. Yeah. Could be ninety days, Nick. Yeah. So I just wanted to kind of tie into the sixty-day thing. Like maybe it just needs to be clearer that as long as you guys see the issue if it's continued you have until the end of time like just a clarification that like in in the dg case they asked you guys to continue until a, a specific time so that would automatically extend your 60 days but i also like i believe it was chris that mentioned it um how about we just re uh reassign the um these um oh gosh variances and stuff back to you guys rather than the zoning board since they really should have a site plan from you and you can't approve a site plan if they don't have these variances that allow their site plan to be legal so you guys should have the full authority on whether their site plan is good and if it needs variances that you guys are making that decision you guys are an elected board and you would have the town's best interest at heart because you're put into your positions by a vote of the town rather than appointed by a couple people so that was all i had to say oh boy all right tim <laughs> um, thank you nick yes just one final thing um I believe that the language in this section addresses, and, and I just wanna reiterate, I wasn't suggesting that you shouldn't have some time by when you need to start acting. I was, because uh, the second part of the 60, 60 day period is, if the planning board does nothing for 60 days, then it's a tacit approval. So it puts pressure on the planning board to get off and do something, but if you, only give them 60 days in which to do something, what happens um, if they wait 30 days? Does that mean they only have 30 days left to act? So the blue stuff really is dangerous and it needs to probably go out of this. Whereas the, the other part that's the other 60 day reference here, two sentences down, just says you need to start acting within two months of getting an application. And that seems entirely um, enough pressure. The, the Conservation Commission has 21 days to act on stuff, which is entirely not enough. It's insufficient um, because uh, we meet once a month. So if somebody puts something in on the first and we meet on the 25th, tacit approval. So that's just one thing I wanted to make sure everybody was clear. Okay, <laughs> that is planning board how do you want to proceed with this i mean there certainly are some very meaty things that we're talking about here um with potential zba impact legal impact um and also uh wanting to be comprehensive and do a good job as we're addressing these now how do you want to proceed i mean i don't know that I'm always pushing for independence from the ZBA. We spent a lot of time, we spent a lot of energy, we spent a lot of time on these meetings um, going over this language. And I think that we should, you know, this board, the planning board should be the ones who retain, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think the ZBA is here doing this work. You know what I mean? So I feel like we're, I'm not sure, I'm never wanting to share power with the ZBA. I don't think that that's a good idea. I think that they should have a very limited role and we should have this role. But that's just me personally, you know what I mean? And I'm just one member, but that's... Would that then mean, Anne Mary, what you're talking about, kind of putting aside the 60 day piece is that we would um, require that site plan review occurs prior to ZBA yeah. review. That's what I think, yes. And I think that, you know, Chris is always taking copious notes. So I think that we've gotten this far in this document and we should, you know, put a pin in it and, you know, start right here. Like, please, you know, let's not start from the beginning, but I think that we need to, you know, get along to the next. Okay. Yes, Denise. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree with um, what Anne Mary said. And, oh God, what was I gonna say? You know, when um, Rachel brought up Whitney Hill, you know, that, that was a little, that was a little tricky because we didn't have all the documents. I mean, I think at first we saw some handwritten plan and we didn't have all the documents and that is going to sort of segue into what, if we are able to get into the new business tonight, talking about when documents should be received, who should re review them, how many, you know, how far ahead before our meeting. And I think if we clarify some of that, we'll take care of some of these issues. Um, but I think, I think we, this still needs a little more work and I don't feel comfortable approving anything tonight. I'd love to look Chris, at. do you think you have, I mean, um, it sounds like, you know, uh, potentially we're talking about as, tell me if I'm wrong on this as I synopsize folks that we're talking about uh, site plan review should occur prior to uh, special permitting by the ZBA and that uh, potentially uh, we may not, we need to act on it within a certain period of time upon receipt of a, of a complete application. We're not so sure about 60 days, I mean, I don't know. Does that, does that sound like the direction we're going board yeah i think so okay all right chris you got that kind of <laughs> yeah um I, I think i'd like to get um adam costa's opinion about the 60-day issue because there is a requirement in the zoning act that you have to act within a certain amount of time um and i'd like to get his his views on that and and maybe bring this back to you um, after we hear from him. Excellent, good. I'll go back up a little bit um, just before uh, Board of Selectmen needs to be the select board. Big deal right there. <laughs> um, yeah, I wanna just uh, again reiterate that all the language we're looking at here is in your existing bylaw. This is not the section that we're gonna be discussing tonight in terms of what we were proposing to change. Um, and that was um, later in the bylaw. I'm, I'm hoping that um, if we're gonna move on from this tonight that uh, maybe the board would consider reviewing the, the changed section of the bylaw and, and sending me your comments or thoughts perhaps by email because um, we've had a lot, of, uh, a lot of times this has come up on the agenda and we haven't really gotten to the, the meat of the bylaw, unfortunately, and I know we're we're running short on time. You're talking about us reviewing the red lines? The, the section that is in the dark red italic and the dark. In the red and the red font are the sections that we were really gonna be discussing tonight. And we kind of got sidetracked um, looking at this whole um, procedural section, which is, is not really what we were gonna be talking about originally. Hmm. So Rachel, if you were to, to scroll down. Um... Which number? <clears throat> I'm at 5522. Uh, fortunately, my screen has frozen, so I can't see where you are. I'm at 5522. Well, basically what um, Chris is requesting, I th though, is that we look at the bold and the red line. Yeah, and section 5520, 5520 is titled Green Development Performance Standards. That that is the section that that was on the you know really on the agenda for discussion tonight. Um, <laughs> oh, Chris. Yeah. And it's it is something that's important that that we try to get to some level of closure on in part because it's tied to the uh, town's uh, MVP grant. We, we're, we're actually doing some of this work under state funding to revise the bylaw. And there's a time, there's a time frame uh, for that. We're, we're hoping to get that, that work all done and ready for town meeting by, by May. So that's why I'm asking if, if folks could 
perhaps take a look at that section 5520 and then um, send me your, your thoughts and comments about that or questions. We try to send them to you within the next week. That, that would be really helpful, yeah. What do we, board, what do we do about the fact that it seems like there are other pieces of this bylaw that are not the ones that we previously looked at, but in fact do seem problematic? What do we want to do about that? Rachel, <laughs> back and forth with you. <laughs> can't hear you. Rachel, we can't hear you. Muted. I do think that we, um, this issue of who goes first and how we work together, this has dogged us all along. I think Anne Mary has, um, makes a very forceful point uh, about mm, how we proceed, who gets to make that decision. We're not making it, the town would make it anyway. So, but we would be proposing it. I think uh, the, the point of an elected board is one thing. The other feature is that we, re we meet regularly Whereas the ZBA meets uh, when they have projects before them, they don't have to meet as regularly. So it, it, that was always a feature that, you know, just even if you were just kind of relying on good neighborly cooperation, that who, what night we met on and, you know, when it fit, fit in. I think a little more regularization uh, more would be really helpful if we're, if we're there. I mean, if we're at that point and nothing dramatic. And I do think the 60 days is something to look at. And I, I appreciate that um, Chris would talk to Adam about that because I can't imagine there's not something that protects a business owner as well involved with the state regs. Well, then maybe what we're talking about potentially is at, within the next week as we send comments to Chris, if um, people can go through the all site plan review section, certainly not with a fine tooth comb like me for select board versus board of selectmen. But if there are major, you know, really major issues that we could bring those forward for discussion next and, and include that on your comments, even though, I mean, it would just be consolidated to send them to Chris. That sound okay? Okay, good. Ooh, thank you. All right, we have two more. Can we move along then? We have two more um, potential bylaws, the ADUs and um, the formula-based business. Um, I do wonder with, uh, Chris, we've put you off on so many things, but if um, we might be able to address the formula-based business, which might then mean we need to do the ADUs, uh, accessory apartments at our next meeting or depending on how quickly or how well we get through formula-based business. How does that sound to, to people? We certainly have a lot of public who are interested in the formula-based business that are online right now. Can we go forward with that? Fine to me. Okay, great. All right, so formula-based business. And I think, uh, so Chris, thank you very much <laughs> for your patience and your work on this. And we're just, we have a always have a warm seat for you here. <laughs> uh, formula based business, Debbie. Debbie Hi, yes, Debbie Schreiber for Come Tuck Drive. We're uh, back again. This is now. This is a continuation of the public hearing. Is that? Oh correct? yes, I need to reopen that. We are um, reopening the public hearing. We will have discussion, and if it feels like we're at the end of discussion, then we can move to and second to close the public hearing and then the planning board would vote on a uh, on bringing the proposed bylaws to town meeting is that i think yes that's and that was my that was our hope is it would be that uh that that the planning board would be vote to be proponents of this bylaw at town meeting and for it to uh, go on to the warrant um so we this is a continuation of the hearing We've gone over elements of the proposed bylaws and tried to make changes that were responsive to what the, uh, the planning boards and other members of the public's comments about it. Um, so I would be helped a little bit by knowing what would be most helpful for, for you folks in as much as we've uh, spent, some, spent some time on this topic, uh, what, is, what would be most useful? 
Um, well, I think at the last meeting, there was a request that um, to sort of understand what's the goal of all of this. And you um, very nicely, you know, uh, sent us something that would basically be an explanation. It wouldn't be part of the bylaws, as I understand it. That's correct. And I, uh, we sent that out uh, earlier today uh, in response to that request by the by the board, but that would not be a part of the bylaws. So it seems like rather than adding in, in an element that isn't directly related, it'd be better to set that aside. But, and that is because these are amendments to the existing bylaws. Therefore, we're, we're not proposing new bylaws. These are amendments, and that's very important to understand. Amendments to the zoning bylaw 179 um, and, and some of its elements, including the table of uses, uh, among others. Uh, what, what would be the, be the most helpful for you folks? Board, I mean, um, I don't think you really, otherwise you haven't made any changes since the last time we discussed. No, that we were not asked to make any changes from the, uh, the version that you have is dated January 23rd of this year. That is the one we spoke about at the last meeting, went over the, the changes that that represented in which we had made some additions to the definitions um, um, and we had uh, we had focused on uh, an applicant having to uh, conform, alter definitional elements four, five, and six, which are ex exterior elements of their uh, proposed buildings: the facade, the um, standardized decor and color scheme of the building, and standardized signage in order to. Uh, potentially develop in the C1 and C2 districts in Deerfield. Uh -huh. Exempt from this is the C, the most northerly C2 district um, on which there would be no restrictions, none of these restrictions on formula-based businesses. So we could have some additional discussion with the planning board as well as members of the community. It's a little bit hard when we've had uh, months between some of our different discussions. Um, right. I will say that um, as I've been talking with a few people in the last month, one comment that was made to me is that zoning is a snapshot of what the town will look like, which I think is really interesting. Um, and if we, zone for development, then that's what we'll get. And if we zone differently, then, you know, we, we, we can't be, we can't be crying in our beer, if you say, with uh, when we make certain zoning requirements and then people come and follow our zoning. So. Um, I love the crying in the beer. I think that's what it is. Um, do you, <laughs> does anyone want to see Annalie crying in her beer? Do you, um, do you have these, Kathy? You do? Okay. Kathy's oh, muted. Kathy, I think she's saying yes, she has them. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah. Kathy, it might be interesting um, considering that we'll be bringing this to, uh, well, we may be bringing this to town meeting um, and wanting, there's there has been a tension between is it pro-business, pro-town? Is it providing good guidelines that will help businesses comply with our, our desires versus is it something that will send businesses along their way? And I don't know what sort of a impression you had when you reviewed them. Well, I think it a lot depends on what the business is and where it wants to go who's abutting that area of the business and what impact it has in that particular area that it's being built. The, what is the nature of our town? What is our demographic? What do we, what are we looking for um, to sustain our uh, revenue, but also stay in line with um, sort of the needs of our people and you know, that's subject to each individual business that petitions to come into South Deerfield or Deerfield in general. That, that becomes a base by base. I mean, one person's going to 
say great and another one's going to say this doesn't align uh so i i think that becomes a, a an individual basis well i think that's what we're trying to do here is mm -hmm. give a little bit more um guidelines to make it a little bit less subjective is that correct Yes, we're really trying to set out and say, well, what defines a formula-based business? And that's the first section, which is a set of that would be added to the definitions in the in the zoning bylaws to say these. Are, this is what a formula-based business looks like. There are ten or more of them. These are we're talking retail. We're talking about retail food-based or or formula. Excuse me, formula-based food service or formula-based retail. Uh, and entities, uh, of which there are ten or more um, existing in the in the nation or in the world, and um, that if they have any of those six defining elements, that allows the planning board to identify them and say, "Oh, you are a formula-based business." So please understand, this doesn't apply to every business that comes to town. No. We're trying to identify the formula-based businesses. And our goal is to say, we want you to work with us. We're not gonna say you can't be here. In fact, you can be in the northernmost C2 district without having to address these issues. But if you're going to be in the C1 or C2 districts in town and you, you fulfill any of these definitional elements that, that I just mentioned, one through six, uh, then, what we want you to do is to be sure that your standardized decor and color scheme on the exterior of the building, your, ex your facade, and your signage is, is going to fit with the rural character of our community. And we on the planning board are the wish to, wish to evaluate that. And, that's, and so that's how it would therefore apply. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anyone have any other um, additional uh, <laughs> views to address? Yeah, Emily, I was just gonna say, I, th I think these are really well thought out. I think it's, they're really th thoughtful additions to our current bylaws and what you said about I think we're pro business and we're pro town, and you know that's yeah. we're trying to combine the two together. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I think Deerfield doesn't want to be just any town USA. And there was an article that I got from a friend. Of course, I can't say the name. A friend that I had actually posted on Deerfield now that was just a really wonderful explanation or description of of what I think most mostly everybody in Deerfield wants to see and wants Deerfield to be. And I think that we should really take this seriously. And I think, yes, I think yes. the one stumbling block is just making sure that we get that across to the general community that we're not trying to be exclusive. We're trying to be no. inclusive. Exactly. This is saying how a formula-based business can be here, but we're asking them to work with the community in the in a, in a way that helps to maintain the um, the the rural character and and works well in as well in um, um, that that will also allow Deerfield to have a supportive network of businesses, uh, mm -hmm. local businesses. If there are formula based businesses, we just we want them to work with us, and and we're we're asking them to adjust those three exterior elements in order to. To demonstrate that. Well, and they may not even need to adjust anything, right? I mean, that's my reading sure. of it. Like if they come yes. in, right. they yeah. happen to have a barn for a logo and they happen to make their, you know, buildings look like barns and well, we have a lot of barns. So, you know, we wouldn't, yes. we're not here to regulate every little piece. No, it could they be that they work. arrive and they have, they have things that are, that work, <laughs> you know, but what it does do is it, it helps to inform the developer about here, here's the rules that we want to abide by that, that, and we want you to know what they are so that we are on the same page. And worse, I think, is when a developer arrives and really just doesn't quite know what the, what the rules are, or that they seem to be uh, shifting or they don't seem to apply 
evenly or equally to similarly uh, situated businesses. And in this case, I'm speaking of formula businesses. So um, this, this is also protective of the town in that sense, protective of the town's interests to have, to have clarity about that. And I will mention too, re reiterate that these, um, that Deerfield in 2008 considered uh, at an early stage, a draft uh, similarly, very similar to this one, and which was eventually adopted, again, very similar to what this bylaw is, was adopted in other communities in Massachusetts. It kind of fell off of Deerfield's radar, radar back in 08, but, but what we're actually proposing is um, our bylaws that are, are um, amendments that are in use in other communities and which have been approved and by the state attorney general. So we know from that standpoint that they have passed muster legally. And this um, just also, by the way, the, these, um, the versions that we're showing you were reviewed by Bob Ritchie, an attorney who formerly worked in the attorney general's office reviewing um, uh, bylaws for their for how well they accorded with state statutes. So it, it, got, it, got, it got a good look over by someone who would know, and that was done informally. We, uh, through the aegis of our um, uh, land use planning consultant, uh, Jeff Lacey, who helped to draft, who drafted these documents for us. Um, let's see, Max, do you have any questions or thoughts? No. All right, thank you. Anyone else on the board? Um, if not, if it feels that uh, we would be at a point then for taking a motion to close the public hearing, and then we would uh, vote on bringing, whether or not to bring the proposed bylaws to the town. Um, this, could I have a motion to close the public hearing? I move that we close the public hearing concerning formula-based bylaw changes. Thank you, Rachel. Denise Mason, I second that. Thank you, sir. Denise, any other discussion? All right. Um, I have a, so when in, well, yeah, I have a quick question. So will Denise, will you, I mean, Denise, sorry, I'm looking at Denise, but I'm saying Debbie, will you be the one pre presenting this or are we presenting this? Aha. Our, our request is that that the planning board be the proponents for this in, uh, in, in its placement on the town warrant for, for town meeting. Um, we can, you know, discuss who speaks for it, I guess, at town meeting. I, I don't quite know how that works. Are you raising your hand to do that, Annalie? Is that what no, you're doing? I'm saying, you know, side by side with, I'm remembering at last town meeting when John sat there and I think Chris was next to him for some of the meetings and whatnot, so. That would be good. We'll, we'll absolutely assist in whatever way the board would find useful and helpful. Okay. All right, uh, any further discussion? Okay, uh, let's see, a roll call. Um, Max, we vote. We're just oh. voting to close the Clo to close. Yes, to close the public hearing. Correct. Yes. So, Max. We can close the pu the public hearing. Hearing. Yes. Aye. Thank you, uh, Rachel. Uh, yes. Aye, Rachel Blaine. And Mary. Hey, Mary, include your aye. Denise. Mason, I. Kathy? Kathy Wittroba, I. And Annalie, I. So it's uh, unanimous that we'll close the public hearing. So now, um, can we have a motion to about, uh, about to bring the proposed bylaws to town meeting? I make a motion to bring the proposed town law, uh, proposed bylaws to town meeting. Denise Mason. What happened to deliberation? Uh, I, I think discussion, does discussion come next? Wait, we'll have a move and a second and then discussion. Am I doing it correctly? Oh, I thought we'd had discussion. Well, 
the discussion was to close oh, to close the hearing. Now we're discussing okay. whether or not to bring them forward to town. Okay, we've closed. Our, I'm just. No, that's fine. Clarify, please, if it's not clear. We're new, Max. Okay. No, I just thought once we close the public hearing, the board deliberates as to its position. I think that's true. So we'll move to bring it to town meeting. We'll second that. And then we have discussion. Is that how we'll... Well, you're kind of letting the cow out of the barn before <laughs> you discuss it. I so, think we discuss, then we vote. We close yeah. the meeting, now we discuss among us, and then we vote among us. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, that's uh, fine. I just... Were you seconded? I don't think... Were you seconded, Denise? I don't know. I don't... I don't know. I don't think so. Reel that back. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So let's have some deliberation on these things. Deliberation is open. <laughs> Um, so, I understand why they, why this is brought forward and the purpose and all that, but I just feel it's, it's, you know, I wouldn't mind a CVS, I wouldn't mind a Walgreens, I wouldn't mind a lot of, you know, formula-based businesses in town, uh, but I don't know, I just, it just seems too restrict, you know, it's like we're, we're throwing up a wall and we're not being business friendly. That's my feeling. You know, the, what about Subway? What about Dunkin' Donuts? What about, <laughs> there's a lot of businesses that are formula based and want to, you know, they've spent a lot of time and money creating their brand, you know, creating their look, their decor, their architecture. And we're just, throwing up a wall to say, okay, but not here. You know, we, we want our own special Deerfield version of, of Dunkin' Donuts or on that. So I just, I don't know how constructive it is. So that was my two cents. Thanks, Max. So Thanks. I'm gonna add a two cents um, and then, uh, cause um, I, I agree with Max in the sense that we aren't, we, we, we want to be sure that each time we make a, what is more or less a restrictive of businesses or potential to restrict businesses, that it's tempered. I, I do think, however, that th this formula based, for, for my money, it doesn't seem that it's saying no, it's saying, please play with us. Please, please keep, uh, the, make the town a partner. And um, yes, in fact, wouldn't we love our own version of your Dunkin' Donuts and that if Dunkin' Donuts came tomorrow prior to this and said, we'd like to put a Dunkin' Donuts here and we said, would you be willing to give us the Haydenville shine? And they said, yes, then we'd be all set. And we'd say, come on ahead. That's a perfect place for Dunkin' Donuts. Um, this just gives us the opportunity to exert a little more influence in that in that invitation to play with us, invitation to partner with the town. Play that's wrong to partner with the town. Um, uh, I know I have felt that with, you know, we've had two recent um, what did formula businesses come to town, and I felt that more with one than the other, always. Uh, <clears throat> So, and, and I, I feel that that is, this gives us a little bit of an opportunity, a little bit of a, um, a little bit bigger voice. So, so I agree um, in the sense, I don't wanna particularly be anti-business, but I also think that this is asking very nicely, forcefully um, businesses and businesses with deep pockets to partner with the town as opposed to just come in and give their flop their thing in. Thank you, Rachel. Denise? I think this just opens up the opportunity to have more of a conversation, you know, just sort of jumping onto what Rachel just said. You know, I, I don't think it's, you know, I, I hear what you say, Max, but I, you know, I, I don't agree with that because I think that, I think that this has been 
pretty well thought out and I don't think it's restrictive in the sense that you may be thinking. I don't know. I don't, I, I think it's, I think it's um, a move in the right direction. Any other comments? I and think it's important, you know, to <clears throat> when we, I, I'm not sure who's drafting this, to be honest, you know, who will draft the ultimate version. But I think it's important to really delineate that these are things that we may look at. Like, I want to just reiterate what these guys are saying, that we're not asking to um, tell them what to do. We're saying that these are some things that we look at. And it's not an automatic no. But I think that in the introduction, like in you know, when businesses come and they're flipping through our bylaws, I think the first thing they should see is that the, these are, you know, a very friendly opener. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I believe in planning board, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if the business meets any of the six criteria, then they must address criteria four, five, and six. And we have we do have some, sub we as the planning board have some subjective uh, interpretation of how well they have reduced their standardized facade or reduced or changed their standardized signage. So I think that there is, in I mean, we're not let off the hook. We do have subjectivity with when they come and uh, change their basically their exterior right is that correct I mean I think they it's well defined what the formula based definition is as it relates to food service and retail and so we're looking at it appears to me and I could be wrong um, the focus seems to be on an aesthetic building and an expectation to meet some communal um, culture, what have you. But this is outside of the business itself. You know, the business practice, the business model, um, the compatibility, the need. So I think it might be wise to, I mean, this is just one piece of the puzzle. And that's this building in the aesthetic piece. But a Payless shoe store is a lot different than Trader Joe's, right? So I think it, I think if we're talking about a limitation, it's limited in what we're expecting it to look like, but not what the business model is. What is the business practice? What is the carbon footprint? You know, what is this, um, what are their products? You know, I think there's a lot that goes into determining a business coming into the community. And this is just one piece of it. And that's the building and the aesthetics and the outside and the definition of what the formula based business is. So it's one consideration, I think, out of multiple considerations. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, let's see, any other discussion, deliberation? So, I'll let someone else make the motion. Whoops, <laughs> we need a motion. <laughs> Either one way or the other. Who are making the motion to take- to Denise, take, go, it's time. The bylaws to town meeting. The motion I made before that was premature, that one, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm making. <laughs> Thank you. I'll second that premature motion. <laughs> Thank so, you. Denise, are you moving to place this item on the warrant for town meeting? Is that how this is? Is that what you're moving to do? Yes, I am. Thank you, Anne Mary. <laughs> the team effort here. <laughs> yes, excellent. Okay. Um, I second that. All right, is there any other discussion? Okay, uh, so no other discussion. I wanna make sure with that. Um, so uh, 
roll call vote. Anne Mary? Anne Mary Cloutier, your aye. Denise? Denise Mason, aye. Kathy? Kathy Wetroba, aye. Max? Max Antes, aye. Rachel? Rachel Blaine, aye. And Anne Lee, aye. So um, unanimously, we will put this on the warrant for the town meeting. Thank That's, you all for your- Thank you very much, members of the board. Thank you very much um, for your unanimous support. That's important and we're very grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you for your work. So- I'm hey, oh, sorry, Annalie, so prior to the, um, to when we have the meeting, it'll be discussed as to who will present, maybe Debbie will present and someone, someone else. So you'll have that conversation. And we can also talk further, uh, as, as Anne Mary was pointing out, we can talk further about a, pre we're very happy to prepare a kind of an, a, like a one page description for educational purposes, for uh, the community going forward between now and town meeting. We'll include a, that purpose, something, or something like what I, you received earlier today and a greater description of what the key elements of the bylaw are and its and its function. So that's something we can happily talk about. That is something apart from a, a public hearing. I, I think that's I think that's only a, a way of working on educating the public and having discussion about it. So we can do that in whatever way you would find most useful. And uh, are we glad to um, be supportive of all that? Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. All right. uh, nine o'clock. Um, if we have a drop dead at 915 at the latest, is that okay with folks? Okay, let's really make sure it's 915. Um, this is a quickie. Uh, Rachel, we want to thank you for your um, work on the Capital Improvement Planning Committee. Rachel is stepping down and um, Denise Mason has agreed to step up unless somebody else wants to battle with her for the for the spot a planning board a planning board appointee on the capital improvement planning committee otherwise um, i'll entertain a motion to appoint denise to the capital improvement planning committee i move that we appoint denise to the capital improvement planning committee all right all right second Second. All right, Kathy, Kathy second. Uh, any other discussion? All right, um, let's see, Max? Uh, Max Antes, aye. Rachel? Rachel Blaine, aye. And Mary? And Mary Cloutier, aye. Denise will have you vote last. <laughs> Kathy? <laughs> Kathy Petroba, aye. Uh, Annalie Wolfkull, aye. And Denise Mason? Denise Mason, aye. All right, congratulations. <laughs> there you go. This is what retirement brings. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Denise, um, there's, a, um, there's a meeting on Wednesday the 3rd at 5.30, so you just need to be sworn in before then. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So I've got to come down to... Call Barbara. and Call Barbara. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we had the next item on new business, um, Denise, um, talking about document distribution schedule, you addressed that slightly initially. Right, actually, I think I brought it up uh, when John, during John's last meeting, but we had so many other things to talk about. You know, th this has happened, I think it's happened on a number of occasions and, and you know, I really, uh, Half of us are working full time, Rachel and Mary, I don't know what your schedule is, Max, and Kathy, of course. I find it very difficult to get, um, to get items sent at the last minute, items sent on Friday, items sent on Monday or Monday at five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock. So my proposal is that we you know, in order to have something put in on the agenda for Monday, that there should be a time limit that we receive documents. And I think that it would be a lot more straightforward um, for everyone. And I think also for 
town employees who, you know, who are distributing these documents. So I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I did um, speak with Anna Lee about this and I'm not sure whether we came to you just, we, we wanted to discuss that to see how many days prior to the meeting that we should be receiving the documents so that, you know, so that we were able to actually look at them and, you know, digest everything and have thoughtful discussion so that, you know, we don't put, you know, Chris Curtis on the back burner all the time too. I mean, unfortunately, you know, I saw, I did happen to see Chris and, and let him know on Friday, I said, Chris, we need this document pretty soon so people have a chance to look at it. So I don't know what other people's thoughts are on this issue. And if this is something that we as the planning board can make that decision. Thank you. I mean, I'm definitely guilty. The minutes didn't go out until today. Um, and it's sometimes hard for me to get on top of. Um, I, you know, I assume people are doing their best, you know, so I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I don't think the minutes are the issue as far as I'm concerned. Minutes and, and your minutes were great. They were so easy to read. It didn't take that long. I don't think that's a problem. I'm talking about, and, you know, for instance, Whitney Hill. You know, really great. And I mean, Jen, it's certainly, it's not because of anybody in the town, but I know that I remember you saying, well, I got this 5.30 the night of the meeting. It's like, how are we supposed to do that? You know, we got a lot of incomplete stuff and, you know, that way, you know, the applicant has to come back multiple times. Um, it's more work for people at town hall and it's certainly more work for us. And it's just not very streamlined, Jen. There's a couple things that I mean I've been speaking to Anna Lee about and also talking within you know the office and with Casey and it's process right so getting an application in, reviewing the application making sure that it's complete making sure that it's the right application for the the right you know purpose and and before it even actually gets stamped in so that whole timeline thing that you were talking about before so the application is not stamped in, it's not accepted until I know that it is complete and that Bob says that it's complete and that you know we know that this is something that the board can actually review and have all the documents that are needed you know, present. That wasn't the case and there isn't any um, thing written down um, in the town that says that, you know, and I know the ZBA and everything that I was critiqued with and everybody else in the office um, with getting documents out to people in time and making it all public, whether it was from what the applicant or from somebody from the town. And it's like, what, wh what is our guideline and what is our time frame and what is our time limit in order to share those documents? And so here I am at home frantically trying to get something up onto the website and get it to the right place. And then people are like, I don't see it. And it's like, well, I'm sorry you don't see it, it's there, and so on and so forth. And, and so if we could have some sort of guideline to say, let's say 72 hours prior to a meeting, or, or if even a week, it has to be, you know, I know other towns and other towns that I've worked in um, have that established at time of posting of the meeting, there is nothing more that comes before the board because you need that time to review all the documents and to have um, ample time to, to review as well as for me. It's like for me to review something and to say, you know what, you didn't give me a stamped plan or you didn't give me a signed plan that actually has dimensions on it or, um, or the application doesn't state which part of the bylaw you're you're taking it to the board for. So you know what to review for because that's what the board's job is, is to take an application and to know, okay, this is section 5300 and we're going through these stages and it's this section and it's, you know, we're gonna go through these um, steps to see if that criteria is met. So that's something that um, needs to be done prior to it even getting onto an agenda. And I think that that's what Denise Manley and others, yeah. you know, I think it's- So Jennifer, what would be your druthers? Like, when do you want everything in? I mean, 
I would like to see the application prior to it even coming in. <laughs> I think that we need to set a standard with people out there so that they're not just waiting for the last second. And um, we have to start somewhere. So it's like you need to make an appointment with the town to, so that Bob and I can sit down and to talk to them and to say, these are the steps and, oh, you have to go to the zoning board for this, or you need to go to the zoning board for this, or this needs site plan review, or this needs conservation as well. And so you can do things concurrently. Um, but I really think it's important that there's a pre-application meeting that happens. I mean, and it, it's gonna take time for people to learn that and it's a lot of extra work, but um, I think it's important because then they go back out and they go, okay, we need to hire an architect and we need to have, you know, plans that show X, Y, and Z on it. And when we, when you look at our application, it says what we're requiring. And so would it be possible for someone to go to the website look at the application process, get their ducks in a row, come in for a meeting with you, and then 48 hours, you know what I mean? 48 well, hours later, they could. They, they could. If, if they had their stuff in line, right? Yes, if they okay. have stuff in line. Or the, the close of business three days prior, is that when um, it needs to be on the, it needs to be posted? No, it, it really depends because I mean, some of this, if it's a, if it's a hearing, it needs to be published, you know? So, I mean, it's like it, it, there's different guidelines for different processes, but I mean, if we're going to accept an application, it needs to be complete. So it needs to be reviewed first and th that information needs to be there before it gets stamped in with the clerk's office, because right now everything just gets stamped into the clerk's office and then it starts the, the clock ticking. And then, and then it just, it has to get seen before the board. So it, there's a timeline. And so then the board has to see it and then you guys don't have the right information. So then what do you tell them? I'm sorry, you need to come back to the next meeting because you don't have um, the details that we need. So it seems like the clock should start ticking when they sit down with you with what they perceive to be a mostly complete slash, yeah, you know? because because you may find something as a board that you want more than what I see you know because I'm going to say okay the application says that you need to have a stamp site plan you need a lighting plan you need a site plan um, sign plan you need x y and z and they may say to me I want to waive that and so there's a part of our application that says that you can waive different things and the board can accept that waiver um and the board can then say, we're not going to accept that wave, waiver, and we want you to do X, Y, and Z. And so then they go away and you continue it, and then they come back with that. But if they have everything at the get-go, then it makes it much easier to go through because you're seeing all of those details by professionals on them. And I mean, it, it, it can vary because you have big projects, you have small projects, you have things that, you know, that it's not, it's not going to be that detrimental and they don't need to have um, all that detail. But I don't know, like just using a recent um, project, it's like, I think that there was details that were rushed and it's not, you know, it's not my place to tell the board not to vote on something but it's like i just know from my experience that she didn't have the level of detail that i would think would be needed it sounds you know potentially i know um i've learned that most of our applications or many of our planning board applications were last reviewed in 2014 i believe it was with their cover sheet of instructions to the applicant so potentially maybe um, does this sound reasonable that Jennifer works on um, whatever, at least the instruction piece is, which might include a pre-planning uh, discussion with you, Jen, but then nothing, things don't, things need to come up, come to us within what, uh, 48 hours, two business days, three business days, close of business three days prior to our meeting? What? I say close of business. We have a meeting Monday. We should, I think we should get it by close of business day on Thursday. You know, that would give people ample time, you know, to look at it. 
uh, before, you know, before the meeting. And, and you know. by that point, it should be a complete application. Yeah. It should have already been reviewed by myself and Bob and taken in by Sue. And we should have all those details. We should have our paper copies. We should have our electronic copies. Um, and then you would have the time as a board from Thursday until Monday to review those details or to come into town hall and, and look at the hard copies upon um, appointment if we're still in the situation that we are now. So basically we're talking about um, two business days prior to our meeting. Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't think we need to have any official policy vote or anything on that. I think- Bob, do you have any comments to that seeing how it's your office and- <laughs> Well, no, I mean, uh, that last minute thing's difficult. Like Jennifer will, look at emails at 5 30 6 o'clock but sue's leaving at four o'clock so if something comes in what might be close of business at five o'clock for somebody that's really not close of business for us i come in a lot of times at seven in the morning and leave at three o'clock in the afternoon and so if it came in even at four i might not see it to the next day i, I don't know i mean it, it's process is what it is it is process but honestly bob better than monday which is what we have been getting right so i i really think if you're if you're jammed up for who's close of business on thursday if we're getting it on friday that's a whole heck of a lot better than than mm -hmm. on monday when i'm not you know that's so not what i'm doing it i, so I get out of here so let's say we have an application in and it's not complete which we're trying to eliminate but let's say we have an application that's not complete and then the items come in on Friday, last second, we're gonna have to say we're continuing your hearing because uh, it didn't come in within that time frame. Mm -hmm. right. And we're sorry, and you, you just didn't comply with our timelines. Right. Correct. And Jen, okay. that should be on the website, Jen. You know, for, for each, whatever their, whatever application there, it should be very clear the procedure on the website. Or when someone calls to ask a question, you can refer them to that document on the website. Okay. I mean, I, I, I've been working on one because I'm trying to like pull from different communities, this community, what our practices, what we want. Like it says we want, you know, a full set of plans for each board member i don't think that that's appropriate in this day and age like that much paper like we have electronic copies we have you can come into town hall if you want something specific i can print it for you yeah. um you know there's just certain languages that are on the application that needs to be adjusted for today um but but i agree with you denise it needs to we need to have a set procedure and to move forward um with that so that we can have these complete applications at the get-go because there's so many things that are just being overlooked and um now that we have a full staff it's it's easier to to manage even though it's a lot of work <laughs> all right good sounds like we have agreement with that well um and in fact, there was something that was received much less than 48 hours prior. So that's the a and and five industrial drive. So we'll put that off to our next meeting as well as the planning board, um, select board well, conversations that I've had. Um, yeah. The clock is ticking, I understand for five industrial drive, but hopefully um, if Jennifer has the meeting and Jen and Bob take a look at it and feel that it's comprehend you know complete before it comes to us again that would be great also more trainings that i you know i i want to look into that the mma has and there's the um um oh my gosh i'm drawing a blank on the name but there's 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 trainings that that we can send the board members to to talk about what an anr is and and how to move forward with it and how to look at plans I think yeah. we'd really like to hear about those. That would be right. great. And that can be something that could just be distributed by email that, to let us know too. That's mm -hmm. great. That's great. Right. That's great. And then to, you know, to do the training because, I mean, it's like we get put between sort of this hard place that the, the board meet, needs to make the decision 
but yet, you know, Bob doesn't want to take full responsibility of looking at a plan. It's like, you all need to know how to read plans and to, and to see, you know, what, what is our zoning bylaw say and what do you have to look, look at, at in the plans as far as setbacks and, and uh, square footage and area. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to miss something that, you know, I need you guys to also, you know, I might catch something you might miss or you might catch something that I missed. You well, I think it's quite at. likely that you're the. <laughs> no, I mean, it's easy to miss something. Yeah. yeah. And but... the thing is, is that that's why, I mean, it's certain people have their own expertise, you know, that, that they, they, they know how to read plans. And I'm not an engineer. I'm not a planner. I'm not, I learned it all from just my, my building commissioner before coming to Deerfield. You know, he would just teach me how to read plans. And so that's how I learned. And so you, you know, you all, you look at plans and you, everybody gets a different idea. It's like, oh, okay. You can, you can take a look at the area and the details that are on it because you're putting the, you know, your trust in the engineer or the architect or whoever has made these plans that it's correct. Whereas I always say <laughs> double check with our own bylaw and, right, and right. You know, having your eyes on it to make sure that it's exactly what we need. That's good. All right. I think we're going in a good direction. All right. Um, our next meeting, if we continue to meet on a monthly basis, would be April 5th. We certainly have the accessory apartments, which um, may take some discussion, uh, coming back to actually looking at solar mm -hmm. and the site plan review. And also then definitely the ANR for five industrial drive and anything else. So, um, I mean, April 5th is gonna be another cramped meeting unless we decide to try to have something sooner. Are... And Ali, remember we had that discussion of whether or not you wanted to ask the board whether they wanted to meet and have hearings on one date and then other business on another date. I don't know what we people- could do that, yes. Um, that would be I just I'm sorry, I have, I have a question. So if we do that, so for instance, it's almost 930, so that's two and a half hours. If we do that, will it reduce the time of our meetings? It has has to. We okay, have I mean to me it's I'm I'm free, so it doesn't matter. But I, I know for the uh, you know others, does it make a difference? And Mary Rachel Max. I mean, there's always a bit of a push before a town meeting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I think that's, I, I, I'd rather meet more. And I think that when I hear mm, somebody's concerned about something, it helps me to focus a bit more. I don't mind. Um, I don't want to make two meetings a month a regular thing. <laughs> Um, but I do think that if we're bringing a lot of things before the town, yeah, I think that we um, ought to be very um, thorough. So that would be my, I would throw my hat more in that. I think you were right. We get Chris here and, um, but, and we kind of jump through. I'm, I've got a plan to go through those again, just to be more thoughtful but i don't always see it, things the way i don't know in that moment i'm like oh yeah that totally makes sense i brushed by the 60 day thing because i assumed that that was a yeah. that's like that's how it's always been it's like the pot roast in the pan you know um i i that's how she always cut the pot roast that way so anyway i, I think it's good to work on it together so the 15th or the 22nd does anybody I can't do it the 22nd, so. The 15th it is. Okay, and we'll focus for sure on solar, accessory apartments, site plan review. Um, that That's, you know, if we try to have. If we can have a, because we have to have a public hearing before we can do anything more with any of those. So that's, a, that's the issue. Okay, good. All right, thank you all very much. So 15th um, at seven o'clock? Yes, seven, yes, okay. And then also the fifth? Yes. Okay, I just have to do my Zoom thing.
All right. Uh, may we have a motion to? I move we adjourn. Second. <laughs> Everybody? Yes. <laughs> Unanimous. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>